a small, I mean, a relatively small group, so I hope we can really have a engaged conversations that we're going to make. Um, I am Diana Block. I'm with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. We're based in um, uh, the Bay Area, but we have also have a chapter in uh, Los Angeles. And um, so we uh, we are have working around uh, people in the women's prisons in California since the mid-90s. And um, we have our, our, uh, our organization is based inside the women's prisons as well as outside. And so um, most of the work that we have developed is based upon our actual you know, ongoing relationship and um, contact and guidance from the people inside who are the most impacted or directly impacted by the issues of incarceration <coughs> in prison. So um, this workshop is part of an ongoing effort of ours to make connections between um, the imprisonment and uh, of women in uh, the U.S. and in other parts of the world because the U.S. Its carceral strategy is being exported. And in the case of um, Israel and Palestinian women, the carceral strategies of both settler colonies have been developed over the past 70 years in conjunction with each other. It isn't abstract. They really are being de have been developed. And you can therefore see many similarities in the ways in which incarceration and the project of incarceration is being managed by those them. And so inside, women, and when I use the term women, for um, us, we are in the US, we're really referring to all the people in the women's prisons who are, in, that includes <coughs> gender non-conforming and trans people who are in the women's prisons. But I'm, for shorthand purpose, I'm gonna use the term of women in terms of the people where uh, I'm talking about. Um, so the control in prisons, as I'm sure most of you know, is really maintained through force, violent force, and also the constant promotion of division and competition, and which goes according to race. Um, it goes very much around gender, discrimination, um, sexual orientation. So those are things, divisions that the prison system and the individual guards really try, try and promote. It's a way of managing people and it's a way of keeping people disempowered and unable to um, deal with their situations. But it doesn't work or it doesn't always work. I can't say 100%. And through our experience and history of working inside the women's prisons over the years, we have seen the development of um, what we have begun to call a practice of fierce care. So it's care, it's rooted in love and compassion, but it has also that kind of militant edge and organizing edge, and that's what we are really committed to supporting in terms of our work. Um, and similarly, though not identical at all, and we're tr not trying to draw a one-on-one -on -one comparison that women in US prisons are the same as women in Palestinian prisons. That's not the point. It, but there are ways that we can see the intersections of the ways the imprisonment strategy works and some of the ways in which resistance is also built in Palestinian, by Palestinian women, as well as people in the US. So um, I'm going to uh, first uh, introduce Ani Paradise, um, who will talk about um, the, the ways in which some of that fierce care has played out or is, has developed in women's prisons in, in um, California. Um, and then uh, Dr. Rabab Abdulhadi um, will discuss the ways in which um, it's, see, it's um, developed inside Palestinian prisons. 
and um, then I'm going to conclude with a few remarks about um, what what's next. What steps can we can you all take? And we will um, have some materials, but we are going to really try and leave time for your questions and discussion as well. Okay. All right. Okay, Great. Ami. Thank you, Diane. Maybe you should introduce yourself. Yeah. So I don't as Diana said, I'm, my name's Ani. Um, Dr. I'm, Dr. <laughs> I'm a member of the California Coalition for Living Prisoners uh, with Diana. Uh, I'm also a member of a small research collective in the Bay Area, the Center for Community Research and Economy, CCRA. Um, and one of the first things I, I want to acknowledge is just, and Diana touched on this too, just that these conversations on, on care and resistance are part of an ongoing conversation that was present in the panel before this, has been happening throughout the, the conference here, including with our comrades at ASU, um, and also part of larger conversations that we've been having. So we were just, um, two weeks ago in the Bay Area, we were just also speaking with other anti-prison groups um, about about these concepts, as well as part of uh, Professor Abdulhadi's Teaching Palestine. Project. So part of an ongoing conversation, as Diana also said, uh, this conversation is definitely shaped by the work that we do with folks inside. Um, their stories, their work is, is part of our, our conversation today. They know we're here today. Um, they're very excited to hear a report back on how the conference goes. So just to make sure that they're very present in the room with all of us. Um, and also just see this as an opportunity for all of us to continue to elaborate on this the connection of care and resistance together and think this as a category in part because I think one of the questions is how can we use this this category of fierce care to um, think through struggles across the US in, in women's prisons across the US and Palestine and also to build connections with with women prisoners in Palestine as well as the larger Palestinian resistance movement so um, I just want to do a couple quick things before uh, before we go into some of the stories, and Diana, you can also supplement the stories. Um, I want to lay out a little bit how the category of fierce care developed, what sort of where that category comes from, how we use it. Um, so I want to do a just kind of outline it as a strategic concept, and then do a very brief genealogy of where the term comes from, with a couple key points. And then move into some of the stories that are that are coming from the women's prisons. Um, so, with CCWP, that um, one of our central statements is has always been caring collectively across walls, and it's a statement that. That we use to we see ourselves uh, uh, reflected in that statement. It's one of our organizing statements, and that's really kind of the, one of the, the points of focus for, for for centralizing care. And always that for CCWP, that notion of care has always been linked to resistance. Um, uh, the notion of fierce care uh, emerged as a strategic concept from the intersection of a number of different struggles. Um, and when I say a strategic concept, I want to just highlight quickly four aspects of a, of a strategic concept that I want to call attention to. One, that fierce care uh, is always an assertion of dignity. Uh, fierce care is always, <coughs> a, a, it opens up the, the assertion of dignity <coughs> as, as when, when you claim fierce care, when we claim fierce care, always opens up a space. <coughs> in that space, uh, it's a space of possibility. Uh, in that space, new relations are possible, made possible, and can start to emerge between us. And it's also the, the fierce care uh, opens a space of uh, it's a space of knowledge production. So it's, it becomes a site where we can co-produce knowledge together. Uh, I think one of the central features of Fierce care that I just want to mark is it's also a, a refusal to be to let other people be targeted and isolated by the state and leave them alone. So it's always a as soon as someone's targeted, it's a gesture to make sure that that person's not targeted alone. And, and this speaks to the some of the points that Diana opened with around um, how 
know, this in and of itself is a direct confrontation to carceral strategies that isolate and divide and, uh, and so on. For a genealogy of the term, I just want to mark four uh, quick points of, of reference from where it emerged. Um, the first one we draw from the work of uh, Precarias a la Deriva, and it's a women's collective in Madrid um, who drew attention to a crisis of care that emerged out of a neoliberal context and in the context of conditions of, of precarity, where they really point to the, the ways care, ha in this crisis of care, the way care has been commodified and privatized. Um, so we're entering into debates, larger debates around care work with this notion of peers care. In the second instance, we're, we're entering into debates around um, disposability and the production of disposable subjects and how, uh, how we're engaging struggles that uh, resist uh, the, that production of disposability. And uh, three sort of primary points of reference around struggles engaging disposability are struggles certainly against uh, dispossession and settler, settler colonialism, um, struggles against extractivist capital that are primarily waged by indigenous women, and um, in the third instance, struggles against militarized policing and, and prisons. Uh, the, um, the <coughs> third point of reference that I want to touch on is its, its emergence at a specific confluence in relation to our work in the Bay <coughs> area, which is really sort of the entrenched long-term struggles against policing and prisons in the Bay at the same time as the Occupy movement is, is coming into, into play. And that's uh, the Occupy movement with its emphasis on, on autonomy and on prefigurative uh, politics and possibilities, but also um, as centering care in many ways as part of that struggle. So just kind of naming that confluence. And just quickly, there's a story that that kind of reflects this genealogy that we like to retell that's actually uh, not from inside, but connects, uh, like there's a lot of connections around it, which in August of 2016, um, a young African-American man, Colby Friday, was shot in the back in Stockton, California. Um, and immediately there was a, a kind of uh, a regime of representation, a criminalization process that went into, went into play where the, um, you know, state was coming out, coming from the police and then circulating in the media immediately sort of started to say he was involved in a domestic violence dispute, he had a gun, he was a gangbanger, you know, the whole kind of uh, this, this discursive regime that's, that's uh, immediately uh, rolled out. And another mother who um, had, who learned of the shooting and saw what was happening, uh, this was a mother whose child had been killed uh, six years earlier in Stockton as well. She learned about the killing and saw what was happening through these, this process of criminalization. And she went to the spot where he'd been shot and, uh, and in her own terms, she occupied it. So she just stayed there at the spot that he had been, been uh, shot. And she actually stayed there for two weeks until um, his, his body was put in the ground and there was you know people bringing food and water and it kind of became a, a, a hub. But she said three things uh, in that moment that I think reflect this genealogy. And, and one, she said, you know, we want them to know that they can't just kill us. Uh, two, we want the community to know that we care. And three, we want them to know that they can't criminalize our children and by extension criminalize our community. So it's very much a, a direct statement around criminalization. Um, and just the, the fourth point in, our, in the genealogy uh, that I think is important to name is just that the um, Fierce care is also a, uh, a rejection of the sort of rigid hierarchies of resistance that place um, you know, anywhere from the, the bullhorn and the Molotov cocktail, maybe somewhere at the top, not that we're against those necessarily, but, uh, but that place those sort of more uh, militant forms of, uh, of uh, resistance at the top. And this is an intervention in that and starts to look at different ways that we see care as resistance. And in this instance, um, I think we have a lot to learn from comrades in Oaxaca who, you know, the, the barricades are as much about the barricades as they are the, the food that's being produced at the barricades, the coffee that's being made at the barricades as well, and the militant uh, activities that are also part of the barricades, but uh, also very much the networks and relations that are in place that uh, precede the barricades. So that's kind of just outlining the, the sort of how we some of the ways that that concept has emerged. In terms of thinking through um, its uh, ways 
ways that it's practiced and that we're thinking it uh, with folks inside and, uh, and engaging it in the women's prisons. Um, we wanted to organize it around three kind of uh, campaigns or actions, even though there's many manifestations of it, but sort of uh, can cluster some of the, these practices around actions to kind of make it more visible. And the first one is in response to a, a suicide crisis um, that hit the women's prisons uh, in, was it 2016? It was kind of peaking then. There, there were several yeah. years, starting in 2015, yeah. that there was a, a peak of mm -hmm. suicides. So starting with, a lot, and a lot of it based on the processes that have led to overpopulation in the prisons, um, there were a number of uh, folks inside the women's prisons that were that were committing suicide or suicide attempts that were, we were hearing about. And uh, a number of uh, mobilizations of care occurred in response to those. Uh, and in the first instance, there was uh, immediately sort of networks and uh, alerts going out to make sure that people on the outside knew that this was happening and that, that, that families outside could be contacted because a lot of times there's a lot, a lot of silence around around events that happened in prisons, a lot, of, a lot of information doesn't get out, so there were networks that were that were mobilized immediately. Um, also networks of care inside, looking out for each other, uh, making sure folks surrounding it are okay. Um, another, uh, in, in one instance, uh, this gives a good example, I think in one instance there was, um, following a suicide, uh, one of the, uh, a comrade of the, of the person who had been killed, or a friend, uh, who, who had committed suicide, she wrote a corrido, you know, so it's a, she wrote a ballad sort of documenting the suicide, which then could be uh, circulated as a, as a sung narrative of what, of what had happened and also creates an archive inside of, of that death. And there's multiple ways, we through the fire inside, which uh, many of you got, there's multiple ways that folks inside document, uh, archive, and circulate information that is that is critical about the violence that <coughs> they face. Um, and often there was a lot of poems that were written uh, about people who had, who had lost loved ones. Um, there was also, and this was a little bit, uh, you know, after, this was a sort of a long, those were some of the more immediate responses. There was also, um, we worked together with membership inside to produce um, palm cards, which had information about suicide prevention and resources that could then be distributed widely across the prisons. Um, there were uh, there were a number of ways that we um, organized with families outside to make sure that there was direct actions, um, rallies, and protests going on, including outside of the prisons, to uh, to link direct action with what was happening inside. Um, so those are some of the, the practices around peer care that occurred in relation to the suicides. There's, uh, and we can talk more, there's more, certainly more that we can explore with those and talk about. Uh, another campaign that was organized around peer care is um, the, the Drop LWAP campaign, which is ongoing, LWAP being Life Without Parole. Um, and again, this was initiated by women and trans people inside of the women's prisons. It, it was um, attempted to sort of draw attention to and uh, assess the scale of the problem as people were talking to each other and realizing that the numbers of people with life without parole inside. There was, um, some of the initial efforts were around uh, educating and sharing resources with other people around legislation that would be changing, you know, that could impact their cases. Um, and there was also a, a brilliant project that came out of CCWP, a, a Living Chance Storytelling Project, which took um, uh, testimonials from people inside about their dreams, their hopes, their experiences, and paired that with portraits um, of each of the incarcerated people, which were then part of art exhibits outside and part of a larger postcard campaign that was circulated. Um, so this, I think we actually have some of the postcards. Um, and then that too was paired with a series of direct actions, rallies, uh, as well as um, a number of town halls inside the prisons themselves, which they can speak to um, more about that. Um, the third area that uh, there's been, that we're marking as a moment of fierce care is um, in response to a series of attacks that um, occurred by guards against uh, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming folks in the women's prisons. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, just sort of gives me a minute to, if, yeah, 
Um, a number of attacks by guards against uh, queer, tra trans, and gender nonconforming folks that resulted in uh, a civil suit that we're currently that's currently active against the CDCR with plaintiffs uh, who are still inside and plaintiffs who are one who's now gotten out. So there's kind of an interesting dynamic there. But a few things to name about the the fierce care around that case, which is interesting, is. In the first instance, one of the things that brought on one of the attacks was that folks inside had already organized themselves to monitor and document abuses that they were facing by the guards. So they were already just sort of cop watching inside or you know, compiling you know, detailed data around like what all this, the officers were doing. When the officers found this out, they of course were not pleased with it and launched an attack with, uh, that included physical force, um, uh, sexualized physical force, sexualized violence, as well as homophobic and transphobic slurs that were occurring during the attack and this kind of thing. Um, <coughs> following that attack, the, the folks inside did a number of, of responded uh, with resistance and care for each other in a number of really you know, exciting ways. First, they uh, immediately documented what had happened to them and started to uh, push for that documentation to be recognized by the, by the CDCR. They also, again, networked so that we started meeting with all of them coming out, you know, saying this is what happened, we need, you know, we need to be speaking to people outside, these stories need to circulate, so we immediately worked with each one of them across a large collective of us and um, created a, you know, a counter testimony to what had happened, whatever narrative the, the police had would put them as the, you know, criminalize them as the aggressors and these kinds of things, immediately created a counter narrative through their testimonies for each incident. Um, Following that, one of the other things that has resulted around that is that the people who came forward, it was known that they came forward and they were still inside in a context that makes them extremely vulnerable to more violence. Um, recognizing that they still, they, they held that position and became sort of nodes in a larger connected network where other people who'd experienced similar targeting and similar abuse circulated through this network so that they could also get visits so that we're now able to compile a much larger sort of series of testimonies around what happened to, um, what happened to, what sort of the scale of the, the targeted uh, violence. It's not to say that violence isn't happening to, to women that don't identify as trans, queer, gender non -queer. It's definitely targeting all of them, but um, it's sort of producing the, the, a visibility around that violence. And the uh, that has also then been correspondingly followed with a series of actions that we've organized on the outside to, to raise awareness, to bring attention to the case, to make sure that they're supported inside as this case is there, and to also always, and this is true with the other uh, sort of areas and actions that I named, it's, we've all, we also are always careful to link the, um, the violence that people are experiencing inside prison walls with the violences and the resistance so for example, in the, both around the suicide crisis where we had a town hall, uh, we had family of Kayla Moore was there, who was a transgender woman killed by the Berkeley police in 2015 and in 2014. And, um, and that was true as well, that we just had a film event with the, the folks that had been targeted and just made sure that families of folks who've been targeted on the outside are there too, so we can start to think violence from the prisoners in the street and in the street. <coughs> And use that as an opportunity as well to start to bring in more um, more stories and more details around Palestine into the women's prisons here. And so an event like this gives us also an opportunity to do that, where we can say, you know, we had this event, we shared the stories, you know, we want to, you know, we want to share from, from Palestine as well. So thank great. you. Great, wonderful. No, no, no. That's a great segue. We are now. Um, um, happy to have um, Rabab reflect on how the theme, the similar themes and different ones in Palestine. <coughs> okay, so um, uh, thank you. I think this is really important. I think it should always be part of our um, discussions this week about the whole question of incarceration and of the privation of people mm -hmm. of the right to move, to be, to be free. I mean, this is one of the most uh, horrible examples of thinking about what does it mean to deprive people of their own 
freedom to do anything, completely being incarcerated all the time, caged, surveyed all the time. Yeah. So uh, in terms of Palestine, I'm, uh, let me just say a few things. One is that uh, in Palestine, there is a very, very prominent place for prisoners. Uh, when people started counting, so after 67 Israeli occupation, which basically made all of Palestine occupied, uh, they counted 800,000 Palestinians who have been in prison. That's a very small number because it does not really count the Palestinians who've been in prison from 48 to 67 inside Israel by Israel, or the Palestinians who've been imprisoned by the Jordanian regime, by other regimes. Like, there is like stories about all the intelligence services imprisoning people for one thing or another. And a lot of, and I'm talking about only, I might actually talk about the political prisoners. I'm not only talking, I'm not talking about all prisoners. So if you want to add the whole question of incarceration, this is a very big point of discussion that we've um, uh, encountered a lot on the delegation, uh, the prison solidarity first delegation to Palestine in 2016, because the people we've met with were all political prisoners. I mean, this was all the discussion about political prisoners. And there is a very interesting dynamic in which the way the Israeli prison authorities deals with Palestinian political prisoners and so on, but also the social change that happens inside prison. Once Palestine, Israeli, the Israeli uh, authorities do not place Israeli um, quote unquote security prisons with Palestinians, the Israeli Jewish, they place them in the blockade and stockade somewhere else. So there is so in Israeli prisons, there is Palestinian political prisoners and there are Palestinian like social prisoners and there is Israeli Jewish social prisoners. So this is the way, this is, this is what the mix inside prison is. And sometimes it changes. Sometimes they put the Palestinians separate. I mean, so it, there is, it's a very, even the system inside it, there is a whole architecture that I think if we're gonna start talking about it, we won't finish. But it's something to actually explore and learn about, because it's really important to also, how does it work? What does, what, what the whole question of coming, having for 15 minutes to be able to go outside for 24, every 24 hours, or you don't have any, or you go in isolation, or if you organize a hunger strike, what happens when you organize a hunger strike? There is also all sorts of like punishments within punishments, okay? Basically, it's all to break people's will. I mean, this is really, at the end of it, nothing about prison that has to do with rehabilitation, nothing about prison to change society. It's all about breaking people's spirit and locking them up. I mean, wherever you talk about it, you talk about it in the US, in Palestine, wherever, it's the same, I think. That phenomena is there. And so uh, uh, I, I, uh, another thing that I think, since we are at an academic institute um, uh, meeting here, I wanted to say that one of the whole, like, really shocking um, statistics or uh, observations in Palestine is that we have been working with Palestinian universities, and I announced earlier we have this panel this evening at American Studies Association on teaching Palestine pedagogical practices and the visibility of justice. And we're working on that with Palestinian universities. And when we looked at the statistics, we have found that not a single university commencement has been complete. Because every single university commencement, there were students who were missing, who were either martyred or imprisoned. I mean, so this is like not a single one. Not a single one. This is, this is, this is really horrifying. Uh, the other thing is that, that wherever we went with the delegation, everybody, almost everybody was a, a former prisoner. Freed, actually in Palestine, people say freed prisoners. They don't say former. They say freed prisoners, freed. Because usually the people who have been who out of prison have been freed because of prisoner exchange. They do not let out people on long sentences like Fatma Bernawi, I spoke about her last night. She was the first Palestinian woman prisoner. She came from the Afro-Palestinian community and she was sentenced to two life sentences plus 10 years, okay? So the only reason that she was released was she was freed in prisoner exchange. So there is, Israeli soldiers get caught by Palestinian militant groups or Lebanese militant groups, and then they exchange, and this is how Palestinian prisoners get freed. But also Israel does the revolving door policy. So then they, uh, they release people, and then they go arrest them again. Uh, and they, they're just the same person, again and again and again. And even the, the last, uh, the, in the Shalit exchange, uh, um, when the, this uh, Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, was caught by Palestinian militant groups in Gaza, and finally they, they, released, they arranged for an exchange, and they released over 1,100 prisoners. Many of them have been immediately re uh, imprisoned again. But there is another thing that's called administrative uh, detention, in which people are imprisoned, and then they are renewable again and again and again. And for instance, now we have a Palestinian legislative council, <coughs> Khalid Jarrar, who is a very well-known uh, fighter, woman fighter, and so on. 
they keep renewing her administrative detention and they say on security grounds, but they don't submit any charges. There is, she doesn't even have a military trial. It's all in secret. It's between the Israeli um, uh, prosecutor and the Israeli judge, all military. And so nobody knows what are the charges. They just keep renewing it. And this is actually a relic inherited from the British colonial times. And if people know about British colonial times, if you look at India or other places, they actually had the same. So it's very, it's kind of like a system that affects everybody there. Also, when they imprison people at the beginning, they actually do not allow them, sometimes 18 days, sometimes 24 days, they do not allow the International Committee of the Red Cross to see them because they are under torture and under interrogation. So I'll talk about that. So this is the, the other thing is, is uh, uh, I'm in, in, in thinking about Palestinian prisoners, there are different ways. So in different times, Palestinian prisoners get imprisoned. There is, it is very much linked to the political context. So even the resistance inside prisons also reflects to what extent Palestinian political groups are unified or not. So hunger strikes sometimes succeed really well. Sometimes they don't because it depends on the tactics and who are anarchy. Okay, can expand on that. There is another question is why are with the numbers? There are like over 6,000 Palestinian prisoners. 165 of them are women, over 300 children and the changes. And then people say, how come it's a very small number of women and why are you making such a big deal? Of talking about women, and uh, it's it's an interesting uh, thing to think about in terms of feminist studies and gender studies. Is it is is the participation of um, women, uh, trans, queer folks, um, different genders, and so on, is that measured only by the extent of their public of what we count as resistance, or are there different ways for us to think about what resistance means? including what has been considered historically as quote unquote traditional roles of auxil auxiliary, like making food, medicine, whatever, and so on, or even getting imprisoned in, in lieu of another family member because you get kidnapped by the Israeli authorities unless that family member resurfaces. And that sometimes it applies to women and men, it's not just for men. So, so the numbers themselves are not necessarily you know, an, an indication of the extent of participation in the struggle. Uh, the, um, then the whole question I talked about the, the, type, the types and the long sentences and so on, I have two, two, two more issues. Talk about the question of torture and sexual violence in particular, and the question of resistance and solidarity. So I want to just mention, I, I, I guess I want to talk about three different, uh, some of them expanded, some of them less stories about Palestinian women. Some of them we've met, uh, some, all of them I've met. <laughs> so, <laughs> some of them we've met. And so uh, uh, one of the, the, two, the, in the early waves of the, of the arrest, which was in the late 1960s, 1960s, it was around 68, 67, 68, 69. There were a whole bunch of Palestinian women who were imprisoned, who were part of militant groups, and who were accused of court and security, including Rasmiya Aude, whose her case is very well known in the US, because she was actually tortured, she was sexually uh, tortured, and she, they basically extracted a confession from her. And so when she applied for citizenship in the US, she said that she wasn't arrested and then basically now they revoked her citizenship and they, she was deported uh, last year. Uh, uh, and what happened with her, and this is the two stories of her and her cousin Aisha, whose actually book I'm really hoping somebody will translate, it's called uh, Ahlam al Hurriya, uh, Dreaming of Freedom. And she basically <coughs> talks about what happened in prison about her, because they were both in prison at the same time. And the extent of torture that she, Aisha, talks about the, the fact that at one point, she thought Rasmiya was going to die. She saw her on the ground. She thought that she was going to die. So Aisha basically went and confessed. And she said, that's the decision. I had to confess it because so they would save Rasmiya. And at that time, for Palestinian militant groups, militant groups were allowed to confess if they confess about themselves. They cannot confess about other people. They cannot let, they cannot let other people get you know, but so she saw the media wow. so she said, I'm going, she talks in the, in the book. She says, I'm going, I, I went to this, and I said, okay, I told them. Then she was being tortured too, but she apparently was not as tortured as Rasmiya. She thought Rasmiya was going to die. And she kept thinking, is Rasmiya going? No, she's very strong, she will never confess, she will never confess. And then she saw her in a heap on the ground, she said, this is it, she's dying. She's okay, I'm going to confess, can you just like take her to the hospital or something? And she doesn't really know what happened after to her cousin. She doesn't know what happened to Rasmiya, but she she basically led the soldiers to her warehouse where she had the explosives 
and they blew up the house and you know and they took her back to prison. I mean, it's very, and she talks about multiple stories of Palestinian women prisoners. We have a huge literature, by the way, in Arabic and in English, about it's one of the biggest uh, uh, literature, one of the places we went to this year, which we couldn't go last when the prisoner delegation was the Abu Jihad Museum for Prisoners Affairs at Al-Quds University. And the reason we couldn't go last year because there was a strike, worker strike at Al-Quds University. So we couldn't cross the picket line to go see a museum which is actually houses uh, artifacts of prisoners. And this was the first prisoner delegation. But we said, no, we're not going to cross the picket line. So we let go. And actually, inside the prison, it's very interesting. They are, inside the museum, they actually have uh, uh, things that solidarity with Pelican Bay, where we actually started organizing the Pelican Bay hunger strike in 2013, which was we started organizing this coalition. It was the hunger, uh, hunger strike in Pelican Bay in, in Guantanamo and in Palestinian prisons. So we came together and we started organizing this big coalition. We couldn't go. I mean, there is all these pictures that are there. We took pictures this last year. We brought them back to you know our Congress, and maybe Diana can speak a little bit more about the delegation. But, uh, but so in that prison, there is all these artifacts of student, prisoners writing to each other, writing uh, notes, uh, having this uh, old, uh, um, um, old what instructions, what they are supposed to do. There are stories about Palestinian women prisoners. There is the artwork that the prisoners have made. There is 150,000 documents in the archives of, the, of this uh, museum. <coughs> the director of the museum is a former prisoner. He spent 10 years in prison, went into prison not knowing to read and write and came out with a BA, and then he went, he was, he said, they ordered me to go, I had to. My comrade said, you have to learn how to read and write. And I said, of course I will. Okay, so he learned how to read and write, and then he got his BA in prison. Then when he came out, he got his MA and PhD, and now he's running this, and he says that Israel has at least 100,000 documents that belong to Palestinian prisoners. They would not release that Palestinian prisoners need, and so on. Among the stories that they tell there is that the, the stories of um, all of them, Rasmiya, Aisha, um, Fatima Bernawi, everybody. But um, the, 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 the two stories that I think that are really interesting because we've met with uh, Rula Abu she is a professor at Birzeit University. She's a former prisoner, she spent 10 years in prison, right? And she and her uh, fiance were about to get married, but then they were arrested and they were sentenced uh, to long life sentences and um, what the, I, when I was, uh, when we were organizing the Union for Palestinian Women's Associations in North America back in the 80s, we actually hosted her mother. We hosted her mother, we hosted former Palestinian prisoners, we hosted a lot of, every every conference we would have, we, we, we have, you cannot talk about Palestine without talking about prisoners, it's just impossible. Okay. So we hosted her, we did a press conference, I actually organized a, a conference, press conference <coughs> for her mom, and another woman, a prisoner, Lawahi Zishabai, who was also very tortured, and she was, um, Israeli citizen, she came from Lul. And we had them speak in the press at the National Press Club in Washington and so on. And then I went to my field research, I met her sister, interviewed her. And then when she was released, I went and interviewed her. And I, I want to just speak about her story because I think this is amazing. So I wanted to interview her. Um, Rula Abu is uh, from the Marxist group, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And they were in the prison. One other woman, Itafi Alayyan from Islamic Jihad, so I, will, I was trying to find all the women. And one of the reasons for that is because these were released in 1997. This was three years, four years after the Oslo uh, agreement between the PLO and Israel. And the agreement has uh, dictated that, uh, well, stated that prisoners will be released. So Israel was supposed to release all Palestinian prisoners. And Palestinian Authority was supposed to close all the prisons and turn them into museums or something of the sort, like Robben Island in South Africa where Nelson Mandela is a museum. It's a museum now. And there is a small prison for Palestinian children, Farah, that actually has been taken over by the Palestinians and made into a museum, an art, art uh, youth center. But uh, so what Israel did, instead of releasing all the prisoners at the same time, they released them in, <coughs> in portions. The women said there were 23 of them in Talamun prison, and they said we will all be released together, all of us or none. We're not going to, we refuse, and all of us we have to be released together. And Israel said no, and they said no, we insist. And even the Palestinian Authority was saying, oh, maybe we can get one out and other, because they, want, they wanted to get people released to kind of show that, look, we are making achievements and so on, because people were very skeptical about all that Oslo, for good reasons. So what happened is that the women said no, all of us or none. 
And so Israel, I mean, this is prison guards with guns and so on, and these are women, and one of them actually had had a child with her, had given child birth in prison, Lamia Ma'roof, when she was hand shackled and uh, shackled and handcuffed and so on. And so, uh, so what they did all these recreative things of actually, first of all, protecting the younger ones or the ones who were helped put them behind. They sh chained themselves to the cells. I mean, basically, they made it impossible until Israel agrees to release all of them, the 23, at the same time. I mean, this was a huge victory. So when people think about victories, and if it's really important to also think about all these places that people are making achievements and accomplishments, and not look at only the big world events, whatever happens. And so uh, so they, get, they were released, and I met them. I, I was attended the International Women's Day event in 1997 in Ramallah where the, all these women come up and they start speaking and it was organized by the General Union of Palestinian Women which used to be a clandestine group before 1993 because all the organizing was banned. So they, all these women became like, I, I spoke a little bit about them for people who were there last night. Like they didn't, were not known because they were under the underground. So they come up to the stage. So I was chasing them because I wanted to interview all, everybody I can interview for my field research, like get as much about it as possible. So I was chasing them. So I called both, Itaf and Rula. And I said, I would like to come interview you. So they said, oh, actually come to Bethlehem University. Today there is a student uh, elections and we are both there. And I said uh, to Itaf, how would I know you? And Rula, I've seen her picture. She said, oh, I'm the only one who's wearing niqab. He will recognize me. And so I went and I saw them, they're both sitting on a bench. And it was very interesting because aside from this resistance of actually, I, I, I wanted to find out how do you support each other? How do you support each other? I mean, there is one thing about taking care of the, of the younger people, taking care of the children, taking care of the, 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 the sick ones. They, they share food, they share medicine, they share money because not all of them, some of them, their families are very far away. They cannot get, it's very expensive to go to a visit. It's kind of like takes from the family to take the day off. And then you go and you may not even get the visit. You may go stand, stand in the heat and then they turn you back. So you do not know. Everything is unpredictable. I mean, this is what, what, what uh, what uh, what uh, what um, um, what repression is? Repression is unpredictable. I mean, like uh, people try to say how it happens, you do not know. This time it may happen this way, next time it's going to happen different way. There are checkpoints and so on. So they were telling me, so here is a Marxist Leninist, and here is a, a devout Muslim, and both of them were arrested and jailed because of militant things. I mean, so we're not talking about even gradations in that. And so, and so they were, they started telling me, no, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to get into all of them. But it was incredible the way that they were supporting each other. So like when the, when the women who were more devout Muslims, and, and I think Rula is Christian. Yes, she's Christian. Okay. And the, when they were devout, the devout, devout Muslims will have the Eid or the, if Ramadan fasting or something, the women who are actually Muslims are the ones who are having their back to make it possible for them to pray, to ovulate, to do whatever they need to do. And this is, it's not, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's very important to know this in prison, but it's not exceptional to the prison. Because in Gaza in 2014, when the mosques were destroyed, the churches said, come and have the Eid inside. I mean, so it's, it, it's not, in the in Palestinian society, it's really important to actually like contest against this whole uh, um, uh, sectarianism because, because of the way Israel is like, you know, they are based on sectarianism and so on. It's not really religious. It's, it's a settler colonial but people contest that. So uh, the Marxists were saying they will have their, they have to have their meeting. And it wasn't just Marxists, they were Fatah who were like the, the centrist group. All of them, they needed to have their meetings. You have, there is, a, in the prison, there is an organization exactly like outside of the prison. And it's even more important to have that inside and coordinate more and so on. Because also if you want to like let people on the outside know what's going on, you have to wait for the visit. And so everything has to be so well coordinated. It's, I mean, logistical nightmare, much worse than we are trying to organize a little event or do a protest. I mean, it's, it's, it's much more complicated because, because everything is governed by what the jailers decide. Everything, all your life is regulated by the jailer. So you have to figure out how you are going to resist and survive. Survive, okay, not go crazy. Resist and prevail and come out of it stronger than when you get there. I mean, this is kind of like, it, I mean, it's, it's a very big, it's a tall order, it's huge, it's very hard. So they were, they would actually like support each other, protect each other, hide when, and this is, and I know this happens in US, you know, prisons as well. It is not named the same way. It, this is, I think, this is part of the problematic. 
is that the resistance inside prison is not named the same way, so people don't tend to kind of galvanize mm. around the whole question of incarceration and jailing and caging as much mm. as like in the Palestinian society. Yeah. And so in Palestinian society, I mean, prisoners are, are revealed, uh, the, the, what do you call it? Um, not revealed, celebrated, uh, celebrated and uh -huh. actually they get scholarships in universities, yeah. prisoners yeah. get free education, no, you cannot charge a prisoner. They go to anywhere, like we go to a prison, with a prisoner to a coffee shop and then the, the, the guy, the, the, the restaurant owner said, no, 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 no. I'm like, no, you're with Yaqub. You like, don't even think about paying. I mean, there is this kind of like really a huge, a very big, and so I think that's that's uh, the, the I, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. Okay, so I was going to talk about Lina Jarboni, but I'm going yeah. to, I'm not okay, going to. Let's, okay, let's, yes, I just. Mix them. Yes, so this is, yeah, I think, I think this last point is really important in terms of the fact that prisoners in Palestine are honored and they are celebrated and that is that's the, the, the most expressive of fierce care that you can have and I think in, in the US the US has successfully criminalized the the majority of prisoners so that the society at large has in many ways, up until the past number of years, adopted the criminalization framework and people aren't honored, it's the opposite. They're stigmatized. So I think the whole um, push around care in the US is, is part of decriminalizing and not, and you know, forcing a different framework around who is in prison and a lot formerly incarcerated people have been the ones who are doing that in, in the US, and also people who are inside themselves. And um, so I, I think this has really drawn out a lot of the connections between of care and how, how it plays out in Palestine and the US. I wanted to just mention, so he, we in CCWP are trying to continue to figure out ways that to put this solidarity, and solidarity is also another form of care, fierce care, mm -hmm. into practice. So um, we have, um, we are now circulating a letter that comes from Adamir, which is the one of the <coughs> prisoner support um, organizations in Palestine around one of the prisoners that um, Rabab mentioned, Khalida Jarrar. I mean, she is a legislator. She's one of the Palestinian legislators, and they have kept her in prevent in administrative detention. And she's supposed to have immunity. As a yes, she's supposed to have immunity. But there are many. I don't. I can't remember the number of legislators who are actually in prison, and there there are no charges. She's not. There are no charges against her. She's just being detained. Anyway, so Adamir. Has, is circulating um, a letter and, and, and for people to sign. And now I can't find, oh, I guess. So if I pass this around, take two, because the letter is the second one, it would be great if people sign it, <coughs> with just your name and your city. And if you want to return it, we're mailing them in to, um, to the Israeli Defense Ministry and a few other places. Um, and you can keep the, the, the flyer that explains who she is. But this is something that um, Adamir has asked their international friends to do. And I think this is an area where, I mean, Palestine solidarity has really developed in the past number of years with the BDS campaign. We, there is really a need to develop it in terms of the support for the prisoners. Because right. the prisoners, are the people who have been on the front lines fighting inside Palestine, resisting. It's not only, it's not fighting in terms of just military, although that's sometimes true, but it's about resisting and then they're in prison. So that is one of the things that we're trying to do is make that connection. We've also, we have a small group inside um, CCWP, which is called Firestorm, which is trying to make international
connections around um, how the U.S. carceral system is being exported around the world. Palestine include, as one of the leading examples, and and how how to make those connections or, and understand and analyze other countries as well. So this is just mainly informational. If you're interested in more information about Firestorm, um, we certainly can get it to you. Uh, and there have been other ways in which we have tried to um, lift up the stories. Um, we produced a pamphlet, which we don't have many. Um, we have a few, but I'm going to pass around an example. A sample, yeah, <laughs> that we need back. That we want to update this. This was from when we went on the delegation to, um, with Rabab and met so many amazing, I mean, men and women, but the women were a particular focus. And so then we developed the pamphlet um, about uh, Palestinian women prisoners, and it's been it's been a great education tool. And it's almost we're almost out of them. That's why um, I'm asking for this one back, but. Um, but we, we're hoping to update it. And um, so those are, that's some of the context, but I'm really hoping now that we have a few more minutes for people to raise their comments, their questions, what it is. And what they're going to volunteer to do in order to push this campaign forward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what, yes, what, 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 how do you see from wherever you are, yeah. how you can um, connect or is there, yeah, what's the role? So yeah, um, I am almost as tempted to, well, okay, are there comments, questions? <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Well, maybe you can say your name and where you're, the institution you're from. Yeah. Or where, yeah. Okay. look at yourself. I'm, I'm Tina, and I'm originally from Moldova, but live in Switzerland, so yes. And first of all, thank you very much, really, it was like, very interesting, your talks, and thank you very much for the activist work you're really doing. I really appreciate. And I have so many questions, but I try to focus on, <coughs> one of my questions would be that coming to the US, I'm just here for since a month, um, I realized that there is a group, um, um, the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement, and I would like to hear if you could like, reflect on them, what you think about them, if you know them. Um, because a I group just, or a movement? A group, and they called um, the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement, and they have a call, which I think is very interesting because they try to bring together um, and to reflect on the history of black Panthers and what and also what is going on in, in Rojava right now in sense of self-organizing and how we can like, um, yeah, create a movement out of it. So yes, I I thought it's so interesting, but I don't know how big this is in the U.S. I just I just so so the here. abolitionist movement was um, initiated in 1998 at the Critical Resistance Conference. It really was initiated by Angela Davis in many ways, who was been part of the big plenary yesterday, and there are many organizations, CCWP included that consider ourselves abolitionists, which is really developing the framework that prisons cannot be reformed in this country, that the carceral model is one that is totally um, linked to the imperialist capitalist pro project, and therefore they can't be reformed, they basically have to be eliminated. So that is what the, and you know, what, and within that there are many, many groups who identify as abolitionists and who, um, you know, so for instance, one of the groups is the um, I, IWOC, the International Workers Organizing Committee, and there was just a national prison strike which happened in, in across the country with many, um, many organizations on the outside trying to support it. So um, I am not sure. I actually have not heard of this it's one group. group. There are like seven groups in the states. Do you know where it's based? Uh, I think online? it's in New York City. They have like a call in the internet, call for revolution. Okay, maybe so it's they, a very new one. Okay. So they, they may, I'm sure they're interesting and doing good 
work. Um, uh, I think one of the things that's really important, though, um, from my point of view or from our, is are they working with people who are actually impacted? Are they um, really um, going inside the prisons? Do they listen to the people? Because a lot of times people can come up with a, um, you know, a certain rhetoric or um, general position, but interacting and connecting with the people who are really impacted and have been thinking and struggling about this, these issues for years is, I think, very important. I'm not trying to say yeah. that they don't, but I think that's a really important issue. I think, I think this is also raises the question of the accountability of scholarship to the work and the community <laughs> about whom we're doing our scholarship. So this is, I think it's, uh, to just reinforce what, uh, what Diana is saying, that there is, we are in an academic conference, a lot of people do research and write, and there is a whole bunch, there is a whole field of uh, incarceral, carceral studies, and you know, all sorts of things that are going, which is, which is great, but it's really, it's important when people are making their academic careers that they are accountable mm -hmm. to the people about whom <coughs> they are writing and from whose experiences they are actually building their careers. So, it's really, really important to, I always like wanna check to find out who, who the groups are. Is this an internet just call or something? Are they connected like the questions that um, um, Diana is raising? Um, I'm, I raise these questions about Palestine all the time. It's kind of like, okay, are you just writing or uh, do you know? Okay, and it's, I think this becomes a very important criteria to think about the credibility of any kind of, not just on activism, but scholarship as well. But also the question of like, how do we from there then how do we find each other and find those groups yeah. And, yeah. and connect yeah. you know connect up? Yeah. So we actually have just had a really as a result of this strike have moved closer to some of the organizing that was going on with the mm -hmm. IWOC, mm -hmm. and that's you know become so you know yet I I definitely agree yeah. you know we want to do the research and not have you know want to know who the groups are and all that kind of stuff. But then how do we how do we link up and what are what are the yeah. issues that they're connected with? And I think the fact that you're saying that they are actually also like working on Rojava, which means because the Kurdish, Kur, the Kurdish struggle has had so many prisoners, and so many like I mean there is, the me, women and women, men, and many many years like month, decades in prison and torture and so on. So that's also really very important to connect with. Yeah. It's also very close to the heart of Palestinians. Yeah. The Kurdish struggle. Yeah, we didn't mean to cut you off or anything. No, we're all going to go home and look Yes, yeah, <laughs> but, but really. I just had like two, two short things. Like one I wanted to say, it's so nice to have also all this um, literature from Palestine because when I'm also in a little group in Switzerland, when we have friends going into prison, we would always um, send them this literature because we don't have in Germany yeah. German literature, so we would send this um, mm -hmm. things which are really important. Important to have this literature and um, the other question, or the, uh, just a little thought, I was like, why don't we have a prison uh, pr a letter, prison letter writing uh, thing here going on, mm -hmm. right? In the conference, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just an idea. Maybe for next year, it would be so nice to bring it like here to this conference. This okay. kind of like solidarity. Mm -hmm. Well, please. We could also write. give you an address if, like, if you leave here and want to write to someone and say we're in this panel. Yeah. I think it would. Be, we have people who work closely with it. That would yeah. mean a lot too. Even just one letter being like. Thanks. If Thank you put you. your name also, um, maybe we can also say you would like to see some German literature or something. Yeah. We can like find whoever is translating this stuff so you can yeah. just yeah. have. Other, other input, quite good. Uh, my name is Sabrina Jamaluddin. I go to Ohio State University. Um, so there's a lot of like gang related segregation in prisons, at least. So I like teach hip hop literacy at a juvenile correctional facility. It's all male, but there's, it's very segregated. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you facilitate solidarity? Or like, how would you suggest facilitating solidarity? Across gangs? Yeah, amongst, oh, you mean? Yeah, amongst the people within prisons. prisons. Right, well, so so um, we were both, uh, Rabab and I, involved in solid, uh, solidarity with the prison hunger strike that began in Pelican Bay in 2013. and. Had a, had a number of victories. And 30,000 prisoners. 30,000 prisoners went on hunger strike. Wow. 
Um, and that was like the largest hunger strike in the United, in ever in the United States. And a lot of it had to do, I mean, there was incredible leadership mm -hmm. from the people inside. And the, the leaders represented four of the ethnic groups that would, who also had gang affiliations, who were in solitary because of those affiliations. And um, you know, one of the things that they did was at some point they issued a call to end hostilities between the gangs and between the ethnic groups. And that was like groundbreaking. So I have no, I mean, so one thing we could do is get you the copy of that call. Now it's, you know, it came from California, but the thinking and the perspective, I think, is very applicable. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, not all young people who are currently in the mix are going to read it and say, oh yeah, I'll just, <laughs> but it's a tool that I think, and it, it served that way very, well in the California context mm -hmm. where many people joined in this action even though they had been profoundly divided yeah. and of course the whole structure of the prison yeah. pushes those divisions. Right. And it had to change as a result. I mean this is, it's not, it's not, again, it's not exactly the same so we don't want to conflate the context but also inside Palestinian prisons mm -hmm. and I said when <coughs> there are, when the various political groups are actually like united in their cause and so on. So for example, after um, uh, the 2006 Palestinian elections and uh, the Hamas victory of over half of the seats, the US and Israel placed a blockade on Gaza okay, to punish Hamas. And they subverted a lot of calls for national unity government for all the Palestinian factions to come together. And it actually was the prisoners call from inside the prison that called on people to come together and unify. And when the prisoners say, nobody can actually question. I mean, this is the prisoners speaking. That's it, like everybody listen. But in addition to that, also with the hunger strikes, as I was saying, <coughs> with the hunger strikes, the hunger strikes work when the prisoners come together and they agree that this is what they want and this is how they're going to negotiate with the prison administration, which is the same, the same thing in, in Pelican Bay. So I think the whole question is kind of like you are on, on the structure that's actually trying to destroy you. If people come together and say, okay, we have, our, we have our differences, we have disagreements, we have all of these issues that we think are really quite important, but at the same time, look at what the prison administration is trying to do to us, so we're going to go against the jailers. We're going to unify against the jailers and make sure that, and, and it works, it works. And th this time, also there were letters from Palestinian prisoners that were sent in solidarity mm -hmm. to the Pelican Bay yes. strikers. And then when we went to Palestine, very long uh, term, uh, political prisoners in the US wrote a pamphlet, wrote solidarity yeah, statements and uh, to Palestinian prisoners. And what we did, and this is really interesting because it also involves a women's studies program that we sent it to Palestine and the Women's Studies Institute at Birzeit University translated it to Arabic and printed 500 copies. So we can take it with us wherever we want and give it to free prisoners and families <coughs> of prisoners who are still in prison so they can show them what kind of solidarity is coming from the US to the prisoners, so it kind of like it was solidarity in action. It wasn't just one act and finishing and so on. So it's continuing. All the, the pamphlets are over there. They've been read by Palestinians and it's in English and, 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 uh, right. and in Arabic. This is another example. Did you have, yeah. Yes, um, thank you very much for, for your, all of your participation. I guess my, I don't even know really how to formulate my question. Um, part of it starts with um, the, the observation of, of incarceration that you made that it's, it's, it's trying to stop movements um, and repression. I mean, I think that that's basic. So I guess, um, let me see if I can go here. If I'm thinking about parallels, mm -hmm. or trying to think about parallels, I'm, I'm thinking about ways that it, you can have intercommunication to, to kind of um, one situation to help the other, because that's what they're doing. Yeah. yeah, so I think about what the French sociologist uh, uh, Louis Facon is talking about the US context, that if you take, for example, um, black ghettos, as they were, for example, maybe the 60s, maybe very early 70s, 
they were places, and black people knew this, he's just done the empirical work too, black people have known this, that, that nourished, they were places of, they were places of impoverishment, but of great nourishment mm -hmm. amongst right. black people. Right. But then, they have now, through forces of white supremacy, they become hyper ghettos. Mm. And what he means by that, or part of what he means at least, is that they mirror, the dynamics in the prisons are mirrored now. And so, for example, there might have been a kind of way that, that people looked to political prisoners and other kinds of prisoners that they might not now. And in fact, there's a former Black Panther who recently said, I mean, this is a little bit out of context, but he, he's, he's, he's looking at African Americans and other Americans and saying, oh, you, you love Mandela, you love this, that, and the other. But how, we're, we're still in prison, we've been here 40 years. Why don't you care about political prisoners here? Um, so what I guess partly what I'm, I'm, I'm wondering also is that right now you're describing a situation where it seems like the prisoners still do have a lot of, I'll even call it authority because yeah. they are. Is there, a, a, um, I don't want to put it in terms of fear, is there a dynamic in the process mm. where in Palestine, because they are imprisoning the people um, more and more, tighter constraints, are they creating a, a kind of hyper ghetto that eventually will undermine that that um, process that goes on between the political prisoners and the people in the communities? And if so, how? Are you, are, are you working against that? And how might we here work against, if, if they're going to be hyper ghettos, how can we counteract that? Yeah, this is a very good question that actually, I mean, I'm not, I'm not dismissing it. That no, requires no, no. a lot of discussion. I'm going to just say yes. Okay. Uh, and the process is called Oslo, mm -hmm. a colonial structure, mm -hmm. and it's a neoliberal structure that actually trying to differentiate. There is multiple levels. I mean, Gaza, you could talk about Gaza yeah. as being a place that actually is a big prison that is incarcerating <coughs> people. You can talk about the checkpoints <coughs> between cities. You cannot move from one place to the other. You can talk about the ways in which they lift checkpoints and impose them whenever they want to punish a particular location, a village, a city. You can talk about the house demolition, that the demolition of whole communities, Khan al Ahmar, Nakov, and so on. So there is all these structures in which a, a new good word about rewards and punishment, the carrot and the stick. So you reward those who are coexisting with the occupation and making it continue, and you are punishing anybody who, are, who is resisting by way or the other. And so in, in some ways, trying to divide the people, and I mean, I'm not saying that the population is unified, of course, it's differentiated by gender, by race, by, by class, by religion, by location, by refugees versus non refugees I mean, there is all these differences what we have. But historically, there has been a Palestinian consensus around the question of self-determination, yeah. right? And so there is, there is, has been very deliberate attempts to differentiate, to actually create a group, a class, and I'm not saying a class in the Marxist term, but a group of people, it could be a class too, but I think we need to more discussion on that. A class of people who are actually benefiting, in, who, in whose interest is to maintain the structure of Oslo, because if Oslo goes, they are going their, their, their money, their benefits, their lives, their, their nice homes, their nice cars, their yeah. nice cafes, their all of yeah. this stuff. Like, I mean, some, one time the New York Times published an article that said the nightlife in Ramallah is better than Tel Aviv. I'm kind of like, Seriously? Like this is under occupation. I mean, why? And people are saying, going around being so bragging about them. Like, this is a colonial structure. This looks like Fanon description of the European city when he talks about Algerian uh, Kasbah and the, and in, in, the, in the rest of the earth. It's like, there is like a whole section. You can just change the names and put it in there. So I, and it happens in South Africa. It happens, it happens everywhere in here. So there is definitely, and I think this comparative st stuff, and comparative meaning not everything is exactly the same. You compare and you contrast and you say what differences, what works and what doesn't work. But I think it's really, really good to kind of, I think it's very good mechanism for resistance as well because then people don't think they're crazy. They don't think they're the only ones who are subjected to these rules. They know that there is, and there is definitely strength in, 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 in numbers and people coming together, so yeah. So I wanted to also respond. Um, 
So I think that's really, really an interesting question. I think Rabab definitely spoke to the, the power. Thank you for coming and being part of this. Um, the Palestinian aspect of, of it, I think there have been various efforts in the United States that um, have been made to uh, counter one of them, counter the, the the, the invisibility mm. of the political prisoners in in the United States, the fact that so many of them have been disappeared and no one from their communities even knows that they are there anymore. Um, the Jericho movement mm -hmm. was uh, a movement, I don't know if you've heard of that, that actually really did consciously try and it was started by two political prisoners one former political prisoner, Safiya Bukhari, and the other one, um, Jaleel Muntakim, who is still inside. Yeah. And um, we are hoping that maybe he will get out after 47 years, but he still is inside. So th that was like an effort explicitly right. to counter what you're talking about. Right. But I also guess I just want to mention, but unfortunately, the success of the huge U.S. criminal system, the mass, what people call mass incarceration, also hyper-ghettoizes other countries as well. And so if you look at the impact of like people from El Salvador and Mexico and um, those are and Honduras who have been taken into U.S. prisons where the model is gangs, fracturing, internecine violence against each other, and then those people are pushed back out mm -hmm. into their, well, their communities in the U.S., but also into Honduras and Salvador and Mexico, and that is, you know, the caravan that people are talking about now where you see people, refugees from their countries that have, ex that have been in fact created by the U.S. carceral project. I mean, and that connection is, almost, is so rarely made. I mean, oh, these people, somehow they're leaving their countries because the countries don't know how to manage their economy, blah, 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 blah. One of the connections is also not being made yeah. is that those gangs are coming back out into black and brown communities yes. here. And so you have caravans coming fleeing violence. In How is it that you have black and brown people within, actually during Katrina, forget, forget this kind of thing, black people weren't allowed to cross a bridge and go into another community. So it's very interesting how there is people galvanizing around this idea that, oh, they can't let them in. Can you imagine groups of black people here in the state saying, our children are suffering here under the violence in our communities. We need to go, we need to go elsewhere in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to go yeah, into a okay. safe community. So this will not, nobody's going to galvanize around this. Well, no one's even going to listen. Nobody. Yeah. Not nobody. I shouldn't yet. say nobody, not but yet. I mean the way that people <coughs> are coming around this issue. Yeah. I would love to see With, uh, if it were an a intern, mainstream yes. Americans saying, well, this is unethical, how can we have this? Right. So you well, that's have a very interesting, an interesting it. idea of something to push that envelope. I and that, some of those connections have come up, too, around um, like family separations at the border, mm -hmm. where that discourse was coming out of women's prisons, too, and saying, <coughs> you know, they've been separating us for, from our children for years, and, you know, how do we make these connections? Yeah, how do we make these connections? Oh, thank you. That's let my people go. Yeah. Uh, 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 I'm serious. Yes. You know, there was the whole thing about, you know, the Soviet uh, Jewry and the and the Soviet Union and so on. There's like all these things that just you need to educate. I mean, mm -hmm. people they need to be educated and organized. Yes, we're at time. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here, being part of this. If you have, is there? There's yeah, a list that has sheet. been going around. There's a sign that, sheet, yeah. Yes, that I hope, yes, we can um, keep in touch. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and thank you, those of you who I haven't seen for a while and who have come to this. This is really great. Thank you, thank you all.